of the Cabinet are present. Uh, we have received apologies uh, from uh, Claire Marchant, Corporate Director of Social Services and uh, Wellbeing. All of the members of the Corporate Management Board are present. And uh, a, a warm welcome to Jackie Davis, the Head of Adult Social Care, who will be uh, representing the Social Services and Wellbeing Directorate at today's meeting. We will now receive declarations of a personal or prejudicial interest, if any, from members and officers in accordance with the provision of the Members' Code of Conduct adopted by this Council in September 2008. And I know that there are um, uh, declarations uh, for uh, this item. And uh, I will ask um, Councillor Young to make uh, his declaration first. Councillor Young, please. Thank you, Leader. I must declare a prejudicial interest in item number five, Leader, the allocations in the Town and Community Council Capital Grant Scheme uh, as I'm a member of uh, Coity Higher Community Council and they mentioned in the report. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Young. Councillor Burnett, please. Thank you, Leader. I too need to declare a prejudicial interest in agenda item number five, as I am a member of Bridgend Town Council. Thank you, uh, Councillor Burnett. Councillor Smith, please. Thank you, Leader. For, for clarity, Lalliston Community Council is mentioned in the report, but my reading of it is that, that that's historic. And th this report doesn't uh, affect Lalliston, any application from Lalliston in, in the future. Uh, so as long as uh, the legal officers content with that, I won't be declaring an interest. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, I will uh, also be declaring a prejudicial interest as I am a member of Kevin Cribble Community Council and Kevin Cribble Community Council has also made an application to this fund. I will now ask the monitoring officer to respond uh, to uh, Councillor Smith's uh, uh, request for, for clarification. Kelly, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, in terms of this item, the members who should be um, considering if they have a prejudicial interest are those who are connected to the nine um, specific items you've been asked to make a decision on today. So if Lalistan isn't one of them, Councillor Smith, then you're fine to um, to remain in the meeting. OK, thank you for that, uh, uh, Kelly. And I, I don't believe um, it is a, a community council that has um, uh, made an application that has been considered today uh, and um, therefore um, Councillor Smith, I assume that you will not be declaring uh, uh, an interest as the declarations will be uh, for uh, matters that we are considering for decision today. OK, thank you, uh, Councillor Smith. We now have for approval the minutes of uh, the meeting of uh, Cabinet uh, that was held on the 23rd of uh, February. Um, can I have a, a, a mover and a seconder uh, for uh, those minutes, please? Move. Seconded. Second. Thank you, Deputy Leader. Thank you, Councillor Young. All in agreement? The yeah. true knack of record of the meeting? OK. Great. Thank you. We will now uh, receive uh, the first uh, report to today's meeting of uh, Cabinet, and that is a report of the Corporate Director uh, for Communities, and it is on uh, the uh, local uh, nature uh, reserves in uh, Bridgend uh, County Borough, and um, a request to declare an additional nature reserve and extend an existing one. Janine, please. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Lida. For the purposes of the recording, I'm Janine Nightingale and I'm the community, uh, the corporate director for communities. So this is a, a, a lovely report that I'm putting in front of you today, Lida and Cabinet. I'm very pleased to be able to tell you that the purpose of this report is to seek approval to declare Bedford Park as a local nature reserve. But it's also to extend the boundary of the existing Frog Pond Nature Reserve to include an area known as the Village Farm Meadow. And the report then goes on to seek approval for future management approaches and resources to look after both the sites. So just very quickly, just a bit of background, if I may. The local nature reserves, they exist to protect habitats and species and provide opportunities to increase awareness about the natural environment. And I think that's become so important for us, particularly during the pandemic, where we are really enjoying what our borough has to offer more widely these days. Now, for a site to become a local nature reserve, it must have some natural features that are of special interest to the local area. And also the local authority must have a legal interest in the land or an agreement with owners uh, of the land in order that we can form a nature reserve. So section three of this report goes into the background really and explains why we're trying to achieve this nature reserve status. Now currently the county has five local nature reserves, Locks Common in Pathcall, Griger Park in Bridgend, Frog Pond Wood in Pyle, Tremaine's Wood in Brackler and the Kempfig Nature Reserve. Now Bedford Park is a long 18 hectare uh, park site. Majority is owned by the council, BCBC, and there are two small areas within that site that are on lease to the Millennium Commissioner for use as informal open space. Now the site itself has, has many, many features. It has an oak woodland and a wet pasture, and both have biodiversity action plans attached to them. And these are some of the oldest and the most valuable habitats on that site. There is also lots of dry grassland, tall herbs and fern communities. And these are all features that provide the basis for declaring this site a site of important nature conservation back in 1995. We also have evidence of dormice and bats across the site and significant habitats of both moths and butterflies. So for all those reasons, we would now like to designate Bedford Park as a, a local nature reserve so it can be protected and managed effectively. When we turn to Frog Pond Wood, this is already a nature reserve, but it's next to an area known as Village Farm Meadow of 0.2 hectares. Now this area adjacent to Frog Pond Wood has purple moor grass and it would benefit from being managed more thoroughly. So the purpose is to include this small area, 0.2 hectares, into the Frog Pond Wood Local Nature Reserve. So if I take you to section four of the report, Leader and Cabinet. This sets out what our proposals are. Well, the proposal is, of course, to designate Bedford Park as a local nature reserve and to extend Frog Pond Wood. And we can do all of this under section 21 of the National Parks Act, which gives us the power to designate local nature reserves. Also very important of this, of course, is the Future of Wellbeing Act. Wellbeing Future Generations Act and also the Environmental Wales Act 2016. So what we would have to do though if we designated Bedford Park as a nature reserve would be to develop a management plan to look after the area and we would work with partners um, to do this. Now if I draw your attention to section 8 of this report it sets out what the financial implications are and a new annual resource of £15,000 is required to undertake this management plan and work associated with it. And we would do this as part of the Public Realm Fund annually. And we would look at uh, putting this resource in place and it would be over and above the resources that are already available for Bedford Park. And already available is resource to look after scheduled ancient monuments and the public rights of way. So if I draw your attention to recommendation in section nine, leader and cabinet, two recommendations. So to declare 
formally declare Bedford Park as a local nature reserve and extend the boundary of Frog Pond Wood to include Village Farm Meadow and to authorise myself as the Corporate Director of Communities to put together a revised management plan for both those areas in line with what we've described in section four of the report. So thank you, Leader. Thank you very much for that, uh, uh, Janine. It is indeed a, a, a very uh, positive uh, report. Um, I will uh, invite uh, Councillor Smith uh, to come in uh, first, please. Uh, thank you, Leader. <coughs> I'm very, very, very pleased to um, support the recommendations. I think this is an excellent um, initiative. I know both parks, uh, Bedford <coughs> and Frog Pond, extremely well. They've served two generations in my family, my children, which is going back a bit now, and my and one wave of grandchildren, and now we've got a second wave of grandchildren ready to go there. So it's already conforming to the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. Uh, and um, I think that it, the, the cost that's been outlined is money absolutely well spent. In fact, it's not spent, it's invested. OK, thank you for that, uh, Councillor. Smith, it is indeed a, a, an investment in uh, future generations and um, does meet the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act uh, uh, 2015. Uh, and um, uh, at that point, I will bring in uh, Councillor uh, Patel as our Cabinet Member for Wellbeing and uh, Future Generations. Uh, Councillor Patel, please. Thanks, leader. Um, yes, it is. Um, it's a great um, initiative and I wholeheartedly support it. I think um, protecting it for our future is for our future generations is um, is fantastic. Um, and I'm happy to second um, the report. My um, I do have a query, though, in terms of management. Um, you mentioned um, management of the area and it just um there wasn't the action plan wasn't attached to the report um so i just want to know um what does management mean you know can you can you just describe some of the activities that we could expect to be covered under that management arrangement please yes thanks. yes of course not a problem at all i mean what we will be seeing in the management of this area is uh, we'll be looking at the grasses and looking to manage how they grow um and looking at species to ensure they've got the right conditions to grow. If that makes sense, we'll be looking at ensuring that those species we want to protect um, are, are maintained in the right way. We may be taking down some areas and um, improving others. That doesn't sound very comprehensive, does it? But it will. The first thing that we will need to do is, is a very detailed survey of what's in there and the ecology, and then put a plan together. But in in particular, some of the areas that we will be um, very keen to look at is encouraging the ecology and the wildlife in the area. I know we've got. Uh, we know we have bats in the area that are protected, so we'll probably want to look at bat boxes and the same for um, uh, the door mice that are there. Um, we need to look at the, the species and look at the habitat that they have and how we can improve that. But an important part of management really is getting information out as well and, and communication, uh, information boards and ensuring that if we have paths that go through the area, they're in the right places and don't detract from, from the ecology, but that we can get our community in there to enjoy it, because that's an important part of a local nature reserve, not just protecting the environment, but ensuring the communities can come in and enjoy what's there also to understand what's there um, and to um, get some education benefit from it as well so that'll all be part of that that larger management plan and protecting the habitats uh, looking at encouraging more growth uh, and managing the communication piece and and visitors sounds excellent thanks janine yeah sounds very exciting thank you for that uh, Kamsa patel so uh, a good question and uh, as the director has outlined, uh, building on that understanding of the local uh, community of the, um, the, the the nature and biodiversity that is right on their doorstep is going to be uh, a very important part of the future management of uh, this uh, site. And we can also look as well, Janine, 
to how it connects uh, because no no site is is stands in in isolation it is connected and we're also very lucky that this is very close to the Kevin Kribu grasslands which is a site of uh, international importance is protected mm. uh, by uh, was protected by European uh, legislations and, uh, and is a triple SI uh, and also um, we have the um, park slip uh, nature reserve uh, nearby too and also uh, adjacent to it the uh, the the rapidly uh, changing and interest in biodiversity of the uh, former open cast uh, mm -hmm. site uh, and uh, we uh, will want to uh, ensure that the 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 links are strengthened the physical links uh, so that those species that uh, do have a wider range um, they are um, uh, they are protected and their habitat is is strengthened uh, I, I can see that um, Councillor Young uh, wants to uh, come in. Councillor Young, please. Thank you, Nida. Yes. <clears throat> I, I would like to support the recommendations. Um, I, I'm in support of, of, of uh, anything that preserves uh, the ecology within the county of Bridgend, but also um, I'm particularly um, uh, pleased that the report is, is and mentions quite prominently Bedford Park. I don't know if you remember this, Rita, but I spent a very interesting Friday afternoon with you in Bedford, Bedford Park, crashing through the undergrowth and 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 catching a glimpse firsthand of the uh, endangered species that were that were living in the area. And 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 I think, to be perfectly honest with you, with all humility, I think the way I was crashing through the undergrowth. I myself was an endangered species. <laughs> However, having said that, I was surprised to find out what was actually there. And the well-preserved, to a certain extent, um, ruins, if you like, of the of, of the ironworks that were in Bedford. And, and the education that I had that afternoon, that I had no idea the importance of the Bedford, Bedford uh, ironworks at, 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 at when they were built. So. I, I think it's it's going to be educational. I think it's going to be marvellous for people to go down and see what is actually there. So I am completely in uh, agreement with the recommendations and I'm happy to support the uh, recommendations itself. Thank you, Lida. Thank you for that, uh, Councillor uh, Young. Uh, just one um, request from me, uh, Janine. Uh, the uh, site uh, at uh, uh, Bed Bedford Park, the, the proposal for the new local nature reserve is, is describing it, declaring Bedford Park as the local uh, nature reserve. Uh, in a um, uh, further report on, on the agenda on the um, Community Asset Transfer Fund, it describes the same site as Wine Kimla, which is the uh, uh, description that um, has been used uh, for the site uh, for, for, for a much longer period. Um, and uh, I, I would ask uh, that if it's possible, given that all, all, also it's a, it's a Welsh uh, uh, way of describing uh, uh, the, the site, that that be considered in naming uh, the local uh, nature reserve um, because the, this also reflects that whilst of course it is a park and that park is a is a crucial uh, element of of the site it, it is also now a, a, a local nature reserve uh, uh, as well uh, and will will help in uh, help in a celebrating heritage of of that uh, site uh, but obviously, uh, I, I would ask if that could be uh, checked in case my uh, history is 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 not uh, correct, my historical uh, knowledge or my knowledge of history. Uh, so uh, that would be a, a request from me, uh, uh, Janine, if that is 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 possible. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, I can see that um, there are no other speakers. It's been moved uh, by Councillor Smith. Uh, do I have a seconder 
uh, for that um, uh, a set of recommendations, Second. please. And and everyone in in agreement. Agreed. Subject, Agreed. To, uh, subject Agreed. to the request that um, we uh, consider the uh, description of the uh, local nature reserve as a uh, Bedford Park, one Kimla local nature reserve. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Janine. That is um, wonderful news um, for um, for uh, one of our most important uh, green uh, spaces in the in the borough. We'll now receive uh, the second report from the corporate uh, director for communities, and that is to seek cabinet approval to allocate capital funding under the uh, Town and Community Council. Uh, capital grant scheme and the community asset transfer fund. Janine, please. Yeah, leader, before you do, I have uh, put in. You have indeed. Uh, so and, I, I, and I indeed and have to. Um, uh, I will pass over to the um, deputy leader to chair this part of the meeting. And um, I will um, leave the meeting, as will Councillor Young, as will uh, Councillor uh, Burnett. Um, and please don't forget to invite us back into the meeting uh, when you've uh, concluded that part of the meeting. Thank you, uh, Deputy Leader. OK. Uh, can you confirm that they've uh, left the meeting, Mark? Alvin? Yes, Deputy Leader. Yeah, um, ready to proceed. OK, Janine, can you present the report, please? Yes, of course. Thank you, Deputy Leader. So the purpose of this report then is to seek approval to allocate funding to Town and Community Councils to develop a number of projects. And we've got about nine projects set out in this report today we would like to fund, please, Deputy. If I take you to section three of the report, this sets out the details of the projects going forward. Um, the uh, BCBC ourselves, we've allocated 50,000 in year for the fund. However, we've got 65,000 available because we had a, a secondary amount and some underspend from last year. And we've also got a desire, really, Deputy Leader, to work much closer with town and community councils uh, and grant schemes and the community asset transfer process in order to provide more support to community led schemes. That's something that's very, very important to us. If I take you to section four of the report, this really is where we set out what it is we want to achieve. Now, table 4.1 in the report, Deputy Leader, sets out the nine funding requests that have come through from Town and Community Councils all across the borough. And what you will see in this report is the last column says whether they have applied for a community asset transfer as well. And what you will see is out of the nine schemes for the Community Councils, six are CAT related. They've got um, six of the councils, uh, town councils have put CAT schemes in. So what we would like to do really is work collaboratively um, with town and community councils um, and to foster joint working arrangements. So if I take you to paragraph 4.12 of the report, we want to recognise the important role town and community councils play in managing and maintaining facilities and acknowledge that they've got the direct link to the communities and they have the key to providing long term sustainable solutions. So whilst we had 65,000 this year um, to allocate, we want to use um, some money from the community asset transfer scheme because we want to fund as many schemes as possible so that as many local communities can benefit as possible. So if you see the table at the bottom of paragraph 4.13, what it does set out here is the nine schemes that we want to proceed with and it shows those that will be funded under the Town and Community Council Capital Grant to the tune of 65,000, and then those that will receive their funding from the Community Asset Transfer 
fund and that's 42,000. And what that has enabled us to do is to fund all of those applications now um, for the nine schemes overall. So we're really pleased to be able to do that. But the one thing I must note here, um, Deputy Leader, is that Cottage Lower only is only receiving 14,900 um, and they asked for 20,000. And that's because they're being supported from an accessible play initiative from the council for the additional monies. So they're having all the money, it's just is coming from two pots. So if I take you to the recommendations then please, which is at section nine of the report. So the recommendation, please deputy leader, is that we approve the nine town and community council grant schemes. They total 108,000. 65,000 of which comes from the Town and Community Council Grant Fund, 42,000 comes from the Community Asset Transfer Fund. That's how it's made up. And also the second recommendation is we'd like to bring a further report to you, Deputy Leader and the Cabinet, if we could in the future, because as part of our Bregen 2030 decarbonisation strategy, we would like to offer a fund where town and community councils can bid to do projects for decarbonisation or biodiversity within their wards. And that's something we'd like to look and shape up and bring back to you in the future so more can be done in local communities. So I, I'll stop there, Deputy Leader. So those are the recommendations of this report today. Thank you very much for that, Janine, and I certainly welcome that uh, further report on uh, uh, tackling uh, uh, climate uh, change and decarbonisation. Um, I also welcome the closer working relationship that we are trying to uh, foster with town and community councils. That's certainly a positive move. Um, can I have a proposal that we uh, adopt the recommendation? Can I? Um, I'm happy to move the recommendations. I just, um, yeah. I just wanted to ask, um, just a point of clarification uh, to Janine. Um, so the three, um, the three um, applications that aren't cat related. I understand that Kevin Cribble is in relation to a footpath, so um, we we own that, don't we, as a as a borough? So that's probably why that one isn't cat related and then the um 20,000 that we're giving towards Bridgend Town Council towards the town hall that they got um they own that building is that right yeah that's right yes yeah so that's that's where um that's why we can't well that's that really um yeah that's fine I just wanted to confirm that that was the case because obviously just looking at it cold um it isn't it isn't stated there but um yeah i'm more than happy to move the recommendations i'm really um pleased to see that um the majority um are in relation to play and i think um it's it's great to see that community councils are investing in children's play and play areas um you know i don't have to say but um you know we've seen them utilized um extensively during the pandemic and you know the impacts of um, the pandemic on children and young people so um yeah it's just really good to see that and i can i encourage more community councils to come forward with um play proposals yes it's a lovely range of schemes uh, nine projects i didn't go through them in any detail because i knew it would have taken us quite some time but absolutely you're right there's a lovely range of schemes there and a number of refurbishments of play areas that, that are owned by those um, or maintained by the town and community councils that's great to see in there thank you thank you councillor patel thank you for that councillor patel can i have a seconder please to the uh, recommendation Happy to second, uh, Chair. Thanks, Councillor Smith. Are there any further questions? Okay, there be no further questions. Uh, that's been moved yep. and seconded. Thank and you. we all agree. Just pause, Deputy Leader, a second to get the three members back into the meeting, if that's okay, please. Yeah, that's Thank right. you. Okay.
Welcome back, Leader. Thank you, uh, Deputy Leader. Uh, just check and see that uh, Councillor Young and Councillor Bennett are both, both back in um, in the meeting, which <coughs> appear to be. I can see them both. So I think we're able to uh, now move on to uh, the next item on uh, the agenda. And that is the uh, first uh, report on today's uh, agenda from uh, the Chief Officer, Interim Chief Officer for Finance, Performance and Change. Uh, and it is an update on the Housing Support Grant Delivery uh, Plan for 2021-2022. And uh, I know that uh, Jill has um, also uh, been uh, joined by uh, Lynn uh, Berry, our Group Manager for Housing and Community uh, Regeneration. And uh, also we have been uh, joined as well uh, by, um, by uh, Ryan uh, Jones, who um, is um, our Strategic Housing Commissioning uh, Manager. So very warm welcome. Uh, to uh, you both. And uh, I will ask uh, Jill to uh, introduce the report. Jill, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, for the purposes of the recording, um, it, my name is Jill Lewis. I'm the Interim Chief Officer of Finance, Performance and Change. Um, and the report you have in front of you this afternoon um, is the Housing Support Grant Delivery Plan um, for 21 um, 22. The purpose of the report, um, and there are a number of purposes of the report um, today, is to update members on the housing support grant delivery priorities for 21-22, and to seek approval to waive the Council's contract procedure rules um, in accordance um, with Rule 3293 for two of the existing housing support grant funded contracts. To seek approval to use the housing support grant allocation to continue service delivery for those phase two low level support supported accommodation project effective from the 1st of April 2021 to suspend the relevant parts of the Council's contract procedure rules um, it, with regards to the requirement to tender for a contract um, and to agree for myself to enter into a contract with Pobble in order to continue service delivery of an existing supported accommodation project. And finally, to seek approval to offer an uplift of up to 5% um, in the contract value of all existing housing support grant funded contracts that the Council has with third sector housing related support providers, again, effective from the 1st of April 2021. And that's on the basis that any actual uplift directly materialises in improved terms and conditions of the workforce. So quite a, a complicated report um, in some respects, um, but a very welcome one um, nonetheless. Um, so the background um, obviously to this um, is, um, is that the Welsh Government Housing Support Grant came into being in April 2019 following the Welsh Government Funding Flexibilities Pathfinder project and it brought together the three former grants, Supporting People Programme, um, Homelessness Prevention Grant and the Rent Smart Wales Enforcement um, Grant. And um, the Housing Support Grant is very much an early intervention grant programme, and it's there to prevent people um, becoming homeless, to stabilise the situation, um, or help find and keep accommodation. So it's quite wide, but very much in keeping um, with the Welsh Government's um, priorities of trying to reduce, in fact, to eliminate um, homelessness across Wales. So in 21-22, um, the Welsh Government set aside an additional £40 million for the housing support grant, 
um, and the distribution of that was in line um, with the previous housing support grant um, distribution, um, which meant that an increase of nearly two million um, was awarded to Bridgend, about 32% increase, um, which was, was absolutely brilliant news, obviously. Um, even better news, I guess, was that the Welsh Government have indicated um, that we really should um, think of this new allocation as our new baseline for housing support grant funding, which again is really, really good news and in keeping with their goal, as I say, of ending homelessness in Wales. Now, they also indicated with this um, new money that it's not expected to be used necessarily for new provision, um, but can be built um, on existing provision. Um, and that's very welcome, obviously, because um, as you will have heard me say um, throughout this year, there's been a hugely increased demand um, over the period um, of COVID over the last year. And we're still um, having um, increases in the number of families and individuals in temporary accommodation. So this is still a very, very big issue for the council. So that the additional money to try and prevent that and to assist is, is really very, very welcome. Um, I think it's fair to say in, in developing the priorities that you see before you um, in this report, <coughs> Housing officers engage very widely across many key stakeholders, including regional engagement and collaboration. Um, and that regional engagement and collaboration is taken forward um, by the CUMTAF, Morganog Regional Collaborative Group. Um, and that meets quarterly with some senior officers and politicians and includes very key stakeholders support providers, RSLs, probation and public health Wales. So a huge amount of consultation and collaboration goes into developing um, the priorities that you see in front of you um, in the plan today. In addition, we've obviously got our own council um, homelessness strategy um, 2018 to 22 and that's informed um, the housing support grant delivery priorities that you see um, in this report. So the delivery priorities are set out um, in section 4.8 to 4.12. Um, and the projects that, that are prioritised are um, in summary to improve accessibility and availability of support and accommodation for all service users to tackle the need to sleep rough and also um, when it does happen um, it'll be brief and non-recurring, to safeguard vulnerable persons throughout the COVID-19 pandemic and you will have seen in previous reports to Cabinet some of the things that we've been doing to try and um, assist in, in that including hotels, um, bed and breakfasts and all sorts of um, additional um, accommodation to to help towards that end of keeping people safe um, to prioritize preventative services making them as upstream as possible and by that i mean intervening as early as possible to make it the most effective support and also to work with our regional partners um, for um, very specialized services that need to be delivered across the region so from 413 onwards, um, the detail of the contracts are set out um, and the cost of those is set out in detail in paragraphs um, eight onwards. And so that was all I wanted to say on this um, leader today. I'll take you to the recommendations at 9-1. OK, thank you very much for that, uh, Jill. Uh, uh, it is um, it is excellent uh, news about the uh, additional uh, funding investment in support uh, for homeless people that's been made available uh, by the uh, Welsh Government. I'm going to bring in uh, the uh, Cabinet Member uh, for Housing, 
Councillor Patel, please. Thank you. Um, thanks, Jill, for the presentation. And um, yeah, I, um, you know, as Lisa said, this is um, really good news. And um, I'd like to um, first of all thank all the staff that work in these provisions um, because they have done a phenomenal job with, um, you know, the amount of people that have come forward during the pandemic, as well as dealing with the restrictions. So I'd really like to thank them. And I think a 5% increase, um, you know, is is fantastic in terms of recognising their um, their um, contribution and hopefully it will help um, them feel more valued. So um, I'd like to, to first of all put on record uh, my thanks and all of the thanks from the Cabinet. Um, I'd also like to thank Welsh Government, a 32% increase um, in this funding um, for this area. You know, um, I think they've said that they're committed to um, eradicating homelessness and you know putting their money where their mouth is really um you know is showing that and you know as bridge end we as a local authority are also committed to um and a council committed to ending um homelessness um, an example of this is when um we put together the rapid rehousing program um and that's where the rsls come together with ourselves and um we house those people, we look through the people on the housing register and we allocate them housing and you know this has been a success. We've um, not had a tenancy uh, break since um, the pandemic so um, you know I'd just like to shout out to, to that project as well and our partners um, you know they've done really really well um, in supporting um, residents of Bridge End. Um, yeah, so I yeah, so I, I'll leave it there for now because I know I can see um, other people want to come in on this, but it's, it is really good news, and yeah, I'm really happy to um, move the recommendations, leader. Thanks so much, uh, Councillor Patel. Yeah, uh, spot on there. Uh, Welsh government have put their money where their mouth is. They've made a a, a bold and a radical commitment to ending uh, street homelessness, but they've matched that with a major increase in uh, investment in uh, supporting uh, those people to keep them off the streets. Uh, Councillor Burnett, uh, I could see that you wanted to come in. Councillor Burnett, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, I'm I'm happy to second this. Um, I think this is hugely positive. And as uh, an elected member for a town centre ward, I can see firsthand the positive uh, benefits that have come from from ploughing this amount of money and they say these extra resources into homelessness it really has made a difference and it really has given um people a chance um at a, at a new life and and i can see how it affects people personally so i'm, I'm hugely appreciative of that and the and the staff that helped that make happen um my, my question really is around the the five percent increase and, and how we can make sure that this money is going to go towards the staff and um th those that deserve it we want to keep them we want them to know that we are um um, appreciative of everything they're doing so and, and just to make sure that that we're not um, that things are going to, all staff are going to be treated equally then really because uh, that is our intention for the money so how do we ensure that that is what happens. Thank you for that uh, important uh, question uh, Councillor Burnett. Uh, Jill please. OK, thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Councillor Burnett. And you've kind of hit the nail on the head, really, um, with that, because um, whilst some of the um, guidelines that came with the additional money um, were, were easier and clearer to, um, to deliver, um, the intention of this is absolutely, as you've indicated, which is to help those who who um, deliver these services on the ground and to give them to make sure that they have the uplift that they should. Now that's um, fraught with some difficulties. Um, they're not our employees um, and um, altering our own terms and conditions um, is, is a difficult um, matter when we are the employer but actually amending terms and conditions of somebody who isn't your employee is, is even more tricky. So, so um, what we've said in the report is that we will 
we will work through with providers some of the mechanics of that and how we can do it in conjunction with um, our trade union colleagues um, and making sure that the money does in fact um, go to the staff um, and the employees who who um, deserve to have that uplift so we would um, we've asked for cabinet's permission to pay up to five percent we're not saying we will pay five percent we're saying up to five percent um, and we will make sure that that money um, does go to the employees um, but also that we don't um, do something that inadvertently causes difficulties for others, which is really important. So we we all know how difficult um, sometimes job evaluation schemes and equal pay issues are. So we will just tread very carefully on, on this one. So you are right, Councillor Burnett, it's, it's um, fraught with difficulty, but the intent is obviously um, as you've outlined and as we said in the report. I don't know if um, either Lynn or Ryan have anything to add to that or whether I've um, I've covered it. Thanks, Jill. Uh, Lynn, Ryan, did you want to add anything uh, to uh, the comments that uh, Chief Officer just made? Lynn, please. Yeah, no, no, um, really, it was just to confirm. I think um, Jill's covered it um, completely. You know, the, the guidelines that um, Welsh Government have researched into this, they are intending, I think, it, in issuing some um, updated guidelines at some point in the future. But in the meantime, they've given us the opportunity to increase this in um, that up to 5%. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, there's obviously tremendous support for it and we, we wait for the guidelines for, for Welsh Government because this has an impact on all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you uh, very much, Lynn. And um, I'm pleased that we've got very robust and uh, and strong partnership arrangements in place with uh, the third sector and providers and that will make the uh, job of uh, delivering uh, this uh, and, and getting uh, this uh, increase to those uh, frontline workers less difficult uh, in, in the region. Uh, and I know we will continue to engage uh, very uh, closely uh, with uh, them in, in doing that. Um, can I ask about the um, the start uh, service, I can see that uh, there's going to be a, a, a nearly 30% increase in the investment in that uh, service, and it, it's a, a critical service uh, because it supports some of our most vulnerable people, people uh, leaving the secure state, particularly young people. Could 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 we have some more details about uh, that? Uh, uh, that that scheme and uh, the, uh, the 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 potential uh, pathways and and whether or not uh, those uh, th those young people are, are people uh, that are uh, leaving um, the secure estate at uh, Park or whether they're uh, people who are, are leaving secure estate right across uh, Wales and are returning back uh, to uh, Bridgend. Leader, I'll ask Ryan to come in if I could. Yes, certainly. Ryan, please. Yeah, thanks, Leader. Um, firstly, is is any um, any individual um, leaving the secure state? It could be any secure state, but who will be looking to resettle back to Bridgend? Uh, so the the start program will work with individuals um, in custody and then through their transition back into the community. And that's kind of in line with um, the Welsh Government Prisoner Pathway, which supports and, and prisoners and local authorities, uh, prison staff and local authorities sign up to to, uh, to support any individual who's in custody and threatened with homelessness upon their release. So, so the start programme will will pick them up whilst they're still in custody and coming towards their the end of their sentence, and they continue to to support as long as as is needed, really, um, within the community. Thank you, uh, Ryan, and. Uh, I, I'm assuming that that program has been has been very effective as we're uh, as we're investing additional funding in in that program. But uh, I'm sure, like um, all the programs, 
Um, it is under pressure because of uh, increased demand and, and need for, for the service. Uh, yeah, very much so. Um, it, it works very closely with, our, with BCBC's housing solutions team and also other other staff such as probation staff. I think it's, it's a very well thought of service locally. And yes, as you say, like like a lot of our services is facing um, increased demand and, and uh, stretched resources, I suppose, really, particularly during the pandemic. OK, thank you, Ryan. One final question from me. Um, as we happen to have a, a report, you, you may not want to stay for the, the report on um, our joint surveys around mental health, which is later on in the agenda. Uh, but uh, we know that um, from previous reports that uh, quite often um, homeless people will uh, be experiencing uh, mental health problems, sometimes quite acute uh, mental health uh, uh, problems. And as a um, and other um, problems that could be substance misuse, uh, uh, for example. But I, I expect those are the two of the big, uh, biggest issues that quite often um, homeless people uh, face. Uh, could 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 you um, outline how we're continuing to work together with health colleagues and colleagues in the third sector to ensure that? Uh, we better meet the needs of 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 people with uh, homeless people with mental health uh, uh, problems, uh, and how that as uh, uh, I'm I'm assuming helped in terms of the huge success of the rapid rehousing program, where um, r remarkably um, we have been able to move people from uh, the streets into accommodation and. And that accommodation, that tenancy is not broken down. Uh, they've stayed within those homes uh, and they started to rebuild their lives as, as Councillor uh, Burnett outlined uh, earlier. Yeah, um, firstly, as you say, and correctly highlighted, a, a significant amount of the um, individuals you're dealing with will face multiple and, and, and complex support needs, which, which quite often can include mental health and substance misuse issues. And I think it's highlighted within this report that uh, over recent years and certainly um, the, the presenting need is, is just increased numbers uh, of those types of cases. Um, a, a lot of our or, or the range of support providers that we have um, will all be kind of trained in, in to some extent in, in supporting individuals with substance misuse and mental health issues. But one of the projects which we um, work on a regional basis with the uh, Comtaf Maganuk Health Board and Merthyr and RCT uh, local authority councils is a regional health uh, outreach team, um, which is um, following on from work that's, that's taken place in Cardiff over the last couple of years in terms of multidisciplinary outreach service specifically for that cohort who, who has those needs and that will be um, a service which specifically provides support to those in our temporary accommodation and hostel provision um, to support those who, who have those uh, quite acute needs uh, in those areas and that will include actual uh, substance misuse, nurse and mental health nurse supported by support staff um, for those in need across the area. So that's, that's an example of uh, specific support in this area. That that's uh, another very welcome step forward uh, as an initiative uh, to meet the the specific needs of that um, of that that group of, of of people that that have some of the most complex needs. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ryan. Uh, Lynn, I can see that you wanted to uh, come in, please. Yeah, thank you. Um, it was really just to reinforce the point that Ryan's made about the regional working on the the health outreach um, service. It started off as a, a you know a sort of a very small idea, and it is a small uh, project because it's it's a regional project. But it's one of the things that we're hoping that we can expand on at some point in the future. The important thing was to get it started because we recognised it was a gap in the service, and it was really getting an in into the the health board and the regional working. So there's you know we have high hopes of um, expanding that. 
But um, just to pick up on the a comment as well that uh, from Councillor Patel in the rapid rehousing protocol, um, we've actually placed 116 uh, people right. in through the, the the protocol, and and I think one of the reasons that it's been so successful, you know, a lot of those cases are incredibly challenging, and substance misuse and mental health is obviously a factor in all that. But I think one of the reasons that it has been so successful is that when we match the properties uh, with the individuals and with the RSLs, part of that discussion is identifying the support services that are in place for the for the individual or the family concerned um, which links quite clearly back to all of the the range of services and the projects that is being supported by the housing support grant so it's you know it's it's circular without without all of the support provision the the tenancies wouldn't be successful so for, for us the rapid rehousing protocol and that relationship is working really really well and very strong thanks uh, for that lynn and um I think we have, we should thank our partners for the way, um, uh, particularly the RSLs, particularly Valleys to Coast, the way that they work so closely with us to ensure the success of that um, uh, rapid uh, rehousing scheme. And uh, can I also thank um, uh, Jill, uh, uh, Lynn and, and Ryan and all the team. I'm saying all the team. That's probably half the team are, uh, are in this virtual meeting as we speak because we, we we have a very small but uh, dedicated uh, resource uh, working in 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 housing um and um my my personal thanks uh, that uh, i'm sure i could be all uh, uh, cabinet members for the the sterling uh, work uh, that you've done over the last uh, uh, year it, it's it's been in incredible um and um uh, that those those thanks also, as Councilor Patel has said, to uh, to everyone in 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 the sector that is that has risen uh, to to the incredible challenge that we have we have faced. The uh, recommendations have been moved and uh, seconded. Uh, is everyone in agreement with the recommendations, please? Yes, agreed. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Jill. Uh, we and thank you very much to, uh, to to Lynn and Ryan. You of course uh, very welcome to stay if you want to, but uh, don't feel you have to. I'm sure you're both uh, very uh, uh, busy. Uh, and thank you once again for your um, uh, for, for your for your brilliant um, work over the last year. It really is much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll make sure that I pass the message on to the rest of the team as well. Thank you. And I'll have to both go to the call when it's a bit sunnier next. I'm <laughs> a bit stormy down there. OK, thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, so the second uh, uh, report uh, from the um, Interim Chief Officer for Finance, Performance and Change is on the uh, non-domestic rates, rates discretionary uh, relief um, scheme 2021 to 2022. Jill, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, for the purposes of the recording, um, my name is Jill Lewis. I'm the Interim Chief Officer of Finance, Performance and Change. Um, the report you have in front of you today is on the non-domestic rates discretionary relief, um, retail, leisure and hospitality um, rates relief scheme for 21-22 and the enhanced hospitality and leisure rates relief scheme 2122. Um, so the purpose of the report is for Cabinet to adopt the Welsh Government's Retail Leisure and Hospitality Rates Relief Scheme for next year and also the Welsh Government's Enhanced Hospitality and Leisure Rates Relief Scheme for next year. So the two schemes um, you have in front of you um, aim to help businesses um, to reduce their business rates um, for the year that we're already in, obviously from the 1st of April 2021 to the 31st of March 2022. Um, and to support continued occupation of high street and retail premises and actually to support hospitality, leisure and tourism sectors as they have obviously had to close um, for some considerable time. So the Welsh Government announced a temporary extension 
of the retail, leisure and hospitality rates relief for 21-22 um, for properties with a rateable value um, under 500k. Um, those properties um, that um, qualify for the rates relief are set out in Appendix A um, and it's very clear um, who qualifies and who doesn't. Um, but broadly, um, the premises um, would be shops, pubs, restaurants, gyms, performance venues and hotels across Wales. Um, and also the Welsh Government have announced an enhanced hospitality and leisure rates relief scheme for businesses in hospitality, leisure and tourism sector with a rateable value of greater than 500k. Um, and they are set out um, in Appendix B. There are very few of these across Wales, um, but they would mainly be the large hotels, holiday parks and stadia. Um, across Wales. So um, those are set out in Appendix B. Um, the Retail, Leisure and Hospitality Rates Relief Scheme for 21-22 will run alongside um, the scheme that you've been used to um, receiving, which is the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. And there's probably likely to be around a thousand um, eligible rate payers who's, who are going to benefit from having no rates at all to pay for 21-22 under these two schemes. So the proposal is that the council um, adopt the schemes. Um, you can elect to adopt the scheme, but you don't have the discretion over any elements of the scheme. So um, that was um, all I had to say on the two schemes. They're fairly straightforward um, and I take you to the um, recommendation at 9-1. At Thank you for that, uh, Jill. I'll bring the deputy leader in, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Leader, and uh, happy to move the report. This is obviously uh, well, it's a good news um, cabinet today. Um, so uh, know that the thousand uh, businesses across the County Berber will obviously be delighted to, uh, to to hear that we are adopting this Welsh government initiative. Um, four two, I believe, of the of the report that, that identifies the um, uh, businesses that benefited in 2021. Now, I just want to clarify: will they need to apply for this? Um, this uh, uh, relief. OK, I'll ask okay. Uh, Jill to um, to respond to that. Jill, please. Um, no, um, they won't, um, Deputy Leader. Um, these have been automatically applied to their accounts, so they shouldn't be receiving bills. I can't guarantee that we'll have got it 100% perfect. There may be the odd one that that um, that might slip through the net if they're a slightly different business, but um, um, they should have had that automatically applied to their accounts. OK, thanks for that clarity. That's uh, 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 very helpful to know, uh, Jill. Uh, can you um, uh, advise if they will still uh, receive um, a uh, bill, even if it's a, a bill for a, a zero amount or some sort of um, communication uh, from us uh, out outlining uh, that um, they, they have had um, rates relief or um, uh, will they receive nothing at all? No, they'll receive um, a bill with the automatic dispensation on right. there. OK, so uh, if they don't receive that, uh, then um, by all means get in touch with us. Uh, but that will be going up shortly, won't it, Jill? But there's no need for anyone to contact us at, at this stage. No, um, I, I haven't got the detail in front of me, Lise, but I'm pretty sure they've already gone out. Right. OK, OK. Um, and, and obviously, um, you know, we'll, we can um, we can deal with any uh, with any queries that uh, uh, businesses uh, uh, do have. OK, thank you, Jill. So we've had a, a, a mover, mover for the recommendations that we 
uh, adopt the scheme as outlined in Appendix A and Appendix B. Do we have a seconder? Seconded, leader. And is everyone in agreement? Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, uh, colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jill. Um, and thank you for the team who uh, will have to uh, administer this. Uh, now I'm sure the, the, the printers will be busy. Uh, we uh, will now uh, receive uh, a, a report uh, from um, a, a report uh, in the name of the uh, corporate director for uh, social services and uh, well uh, being uh, and uh, that uh, report will be uh, presented by uh, our head of uh, adult uh, social care and it is on the uh, proposal for a new um, section 33 uh, partnership agreement between the authority and Comtaf Morganog University Health Board NHS Trust. Jackie, please. Thank you, leader. And for the purpose of the recording, I am Jackie Davis, the head of adult social care. So today I want to present a, to Cabinet a proposal to renew the formal Section 33 agreement with our Health Board um, and this is regarding the integrated mental health um, daytime opportunities. So this agreement has been in place um, with, with Bugen since October 2008 and has been um, revised and extended on a number of occasions and the details of which are contained within the background section of the report. So the current Section 33 agreement will expire um, on the 31st of March 2021. And the service has progressed considerably in the, in the last 13 years and it's now time to renew this agreement and ensure that it reflects the changes that have taken place but also reflects the current situation inc including the budget and our, our staffing details really. So. So in summary, really, the, the service offers a responsive and accessible um, service for a person who's um, recovering from an episode of mental health. And, our, and the local plans that we have in place and the range of services include preventative services, um, a signposting service for advice and guidance. It does offer um, specific occupational therapy services and we have um, short term support services and um, for social support, but also employment support and advice. So the public have always been able to access this um, advice and guidance service without the need for a referral. But the service acts as a main point of contact for many mainstream community organisations and agencies. So it works across the borough with, um, as it says, you know, quite a number of different agencies. And we provide lots of information and support to individuals, but also to our third sector um, organisations, employers and our local colleges. So we have a network of um, community infrastructure that um, the ARC supports a number, number of these really. So the service supports all mental health services in Bridgend's locality and provides opportunities for individuals to improve their mental health and well-being, to enhance their life size, uh, lifestyles and to maximise function and independence through using the existing community resources. So throughout the pandemic, as with a number of services um, in the health and social care arena, the service had to change how it delivered those services. But the refer referral rates into the ARC service did remain open. And through the first um, quarter and during the initial stages of um, us learning about the restrictions and applying those restrictions, we continued to deliver the service through a telephone contact and, and video platforms. And we did have um, alongside our face to face contact where we were assessed and risk assessed to do that really. So, um, so we've continued to receive um, referrals through the last 12 months and through from, from the public and from um, our GP services. However, the number of referrals did reduce um, again, as we saw in a number of our services. Um, and in the very beginning, the reduction in GP referrals was significant for us. But I'm pleased to say that now that those referrals um, have grown steady, 
steadily and to a level that um, you know we we were pre, you know, pre COVID really. So um, so another example in the reduction um, is the reduction in the use of our information and advice clinics, which we provided on a drop in basis. And again, this is without any formal referral route. So at the at the onset of um, COVID, the, these sessions were suspended and contact was made through alternative um, ways, really. We, did, we still continued with face-to-face -face contact in a limited number of cases, but in the main, we replaced this with telephone and, um, and other, you know, contacts electronically, really. So, um, so the staff have been continuing to work with these restrictions um, and you know, partly from home and partly from a building basis. But um, what, what the service are doing now is it's been working on its recovery plan and some of the targeted um, support that we will now deliver over the next 12 months and linking it to some of the information in the in the previous report, really, um, about targeting um, you know, specific areas of, of the population, really. So we are going to um, look at providing targeted counselling support, and this could be bereavement counselling for, for young people and you know, for family relationships um, counselling and a number of other areas. We are looking to do some um, wellbeing and resilience group work and courses and some social engagement and connection support as well as some peer monitoring and some specific stuff around debt and finance and support really in, in that area. So what the what we so the report today, um, the, the revised section 33 agreement sets out the rain arrangements under which the combined service will operate and they're detailed in 4.1. And the agreement, um, the report provides details of the agreement that will be provided by a partnership management group and 4.2 provides the details who who um, who are part of that group. So should um, Cabinet approve entering in, into the revised agreement, we'd be looking to do this for a further three years and therefore the agreement would expire on March um, 2025. And it's recommended to Cabinet today that the, the proposal is that we enter into this um, re renewed agreement um, with with um, Kumtaf Maganog University Health Board. So, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Jackie. Um, and I'll bring uh, Councillor Burnett in, please. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, I'm very happy to to move this report. It's a it's a very valuable and successful partnership that we have with the Health Board, board and we know how effective this resource is for us as 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 a county. Again, it's it's on it's on my patch, so I I know, I know how valuable the Arc Surface is and how many people it helps and how many people it's going to need to help. Um, in the in the coming months um, as we come out of this um, pandemic hopefully for the last time um, I know that mental health services have taken a hit and, and that many people have been discouraged from going to their GP over something like mental health because it's, it's, it's something that you can put aside and something you can say oh well it's not really that important I won't bother people over it um you know I'll, I'll make do but it's you know I just want to um to assure everybody that 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 mental health issues are taken very very seriously at the GPs and with us as an authority and that there is always help there for them um, and, and that, you know, not to be afraid to ask because that's what we're there for. Um, so, yeah, I, I would like to have a little bit more in, uh, information really on, on how we're going to sort of pick up on this on on the people that have been reticent to come forward um and and how we're working with our gps and our um in in our cluster groups within the authority to to make sure that everybody that needs support um is encouraged to come forward thank you for that uh councillor burnett um uh, could could you respond to to, to that please uh uh, Jack, you think it's uh, uh, an important question there from uh, uh, Councillor Burnett? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. 
Um, in, in terms of um, the recovery plan that we've been jointly working on um, with, with our health colleagues, you know, part of um, part of that is looking at um, our referrals and looking at where those referrals come from and then looking at, you know, and, and that could be um, either through organisations or, or actually looking at the geographical parts of the borough that are being referred in and, and what that then gives you is those areas that aren't being referred in for us to then do some targeted work in those areas. So all of that is currently being mapped out and is part of a, an ongoing um, plan for the next 12 months. And specifically then we will be linking into um, our GP clusters, into our networks and to, into our formal arrangements. And also we, we've, um, you know, now that the health board is organised in such a way that we've got very senior colleagues in our Bridge End local integration group that we'll be able to, um, you know, have direct access in, into all of those um, areas where we feel that um, that we can provide support or the service needs to be enhanced. That that's encouraging to hear, Jackie, and, and, and no doubt um, we're keeping a very careful eye on uh, on the, the need and the demand for these services. And if we need to scale them up, we will we'll scale them up uh, at, together with our partners uh, to make sure that that, that need is, is met. Uh, thank you, Jackie. Councillor Young, uh, you wanted to come in, please. Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, I, I think everybody recognises the fact that we we now more than ever need uh, such support mechanisms for those in society that are finding it very, very difficult to cope, especially with the the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions that are being placed on society at the moment. It, it, all the trends are rising. People are feeling anxious. Uh, they feel as if they're not coping. There's loneliness. Um, and I, I, I think that those factors in itself will help to, um, to, to, to increase the levels of those people that are uh, considering or have considered suicide uh, and I think that it's an extra burden because people did need these support mechanisms before the pandemic came along. And what the pandemic did is to increase the level of support that people needed but I think if the pandemic has done anything it's to highlight the need these support mechanisms because people suddenly realize when the incredible uh, strain that society is is under so i welcome the report leader and i'm quite happy to second the report one thing i am particularly happy about is the fact that there is no referral required which means that that takes away the stigma if you like of people who might be um put off as it were um looking for such help as is as as, as is um at uh being offered within the support service because they feel that they would have to go and people would know the condition that they're they're under the, the strain that they're under and that might put people off from finding help but the fact that there's no referral to this takes away that stigma so i'm i'm very happy to second this uh and um uh well done everybody um I'm, I'm, I'm really pleased that we are going to continue this. It's been there for 13 years <coughs> and, and it's developed, hasn't it? It's, it's evolved uh, and I think uh, it hasn't stopped evolving and it won't stop evolving while we're in the situation of a pandemic. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Young. Uh, uh, for points very well made then. Uh, and that is a, a message we need to keep reminding people of that uh, they do, if they are afraid, if they're confused, if they're sad, if they're angry, uh, they haven't got to deal with it on their own. Uh, speak to somebody about it and contact us. Talk to somebody about it. Don't try and deal with it on your own. And if you're in a crisis, uh, help is available. We can help you. 
please get in touch uh, uh, with us. You don't have to deal with this on, on your own. Um, and um, we'll, that, we'll continue to provide that support. And that support is available 24 seven, isn't it, Jackie? Uh, for those uh, th those people that, that need it. OK, uh, so that uh, report has been uh, moved and uh, seconded. Uh, is uh, everyone in agreement with the uh, recommendations? Agreed. Yeah, agreed. Thank you, okay. <clears throat> colleagues. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jackie. And, uh, uh, and once again, um, I'd also like to take the opportunity to, to thank uh, the staff. This is another group of our staff that have had to work throughout the pandemic. Uh, they haven't been furloughed. In fact, they've never been so busy, have they, uh, Jackie? Um, and um, uh, they, 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 they're dealing with some of the most difficult set of circumstances that people out there have, have ever experienced. And we are, are truly grateful for what uh, they are doing for for, for uh, the people in our communities. Uh, so please extend our our appreciation and our thanks uh, to them as well. Thank you. I will do. Thank you, leader. Thank, thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, next uh, report on the agenda uh, is of the uh, Chief Officer for Legal, HR and uh, Regulatory Services. And uh, the report is on the dates of Cabinet. Uh, and cabinet committees for 2021 to 2022. Kelly, please. Thank you, Leader. Uh, for the purposes of the recording, uh, my name is Kelly Watson, Chief Officer, Legal HR and Regulatory Services. Uh, the purpose of this report today, members, is to seek your approval for the schedule of meetings of cabinet, cabinet committee corporate parenting, and cabinet committee equalities for the period May 2021 to April 2022. Uh, if approved today, the schedule of meetings will be put into the proposed programme of meetings that will be reported to the annual meeting of council on the 19th of May. And this will help um, ensure that meeting dates of cabinet council and other council committees um, don't conflict with each other where possible. Uh, members, you'll see set out at paragraph four the proposed dates of the meetings for those um, three committees. And if if members are happy with the dates proposed, I take you to the recommendations of paragraph nine and ask for your approval. Thank you, leader. OK, thank you, uh, Kelly. Uh, Councillor Patel, please. Yeah, I just um, I'm happy to move the recommendations and the report of check the dates are as they <laughs> are correct. <laughs> and um, unfortunately, one of them does come into the school holidays, but I think um, right. all the others are um, family friendly ones. So, um, yeah, so I'm happy to uh, to to move the recommendations. OK, thank you, Kamsapta. Well, we'll we'll just I'm sure we can confirm closer to the time that date that is it during the school holidays and perhaps just have a quick uh, check of the uh, composition of that committee and the officers because we 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 have tried uh, uh, and worked hard haven't we Kelly to make it, sure that the I was just going to say it is it's the equalities cabinet meeting at the end of July and um, right. it comes into the school holidays and um, unfortunately I have asked um, if that could be moved um, but we're waiting for a report from Welsh Government and so this is it's kind of just the timing of it and right, obviously okay. we'd like it to be considered um, sooner rather than waiting until September for that to come through and for the work to start on that so that's kind of the only one that kind of falls into that trap. Well, what we may want to do then is consider whether that report could be deferred if it does not arrive early enough. If it is about, um, um, is it about st street naming? Is, it, is that the report? <laughs> no, it's not. I don't think okay. so. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll 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 consider that then, um, because uh, we are uh, trying to be as considerate as we can be uh, uh, of of the needs of. Of of members and of course of of staff as well to ensure that um, that the meetings are held at uh, uh, at times that are um, uh, that are suitable for everyone. Okay, thanks. Uh, that's uh, uh, moved. And do we have a second there? Second. All agreed. 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 Thank you. <laughs> we now receive the uh, final uh, report. 
of today's uh, cabinet meeting and it is a, a report of the corporate director for education and family support and it is on ban b of the school modernization program and the outcome of the consultation on gen west schools uh, modernization proposal lindsay please thank you leader for the purpose of the recording i'm lindsay harvey i'm the corporate director for education and family support leader with your permission i've got gainer thomas with me today um, Gaynor will be um, with me to answer any queries at the end of the report. Um, the purpose of this report, Leader, is just to inform Cabinet of the outcome of the consultation of the Bridgend West Schools Modernisation Proposal and present the findings of the consultation and then to seek approval to progress the publication of a public notice as prescribed in the School Organisation Code. The background of the School Modernisation Programme Leader is set out in paragraph 3. In January 2020, Cabinet gave approval for the Regen West schemes <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to be taken via the Mutual Investment Model or MIM funding arrangements. The preferred way forward for the Regen West scheme were the preferred education options for provision of a new build two form entry English medium school on a site suitable for having available in a Connelly primary schools combined and the provision of a new build two form entry Welsh medium school on a site suitable for an enlarged Escolaverchoske. The preferred site for the, the new schools were determined by Cabinet as the Valleys to Coast owned Malis Estate site and the existing Escolaverchoske Connelly Integrated Children's Centre and Connelly Primary School site. In January 21, Cabinet gave permission to formally consult on the Bridgend West proposal and this report leader outlines the responses to the consultation and seeks approval to continue to progress to the next stage. Paragraph 4 outlines the consultation process. The consultation document invited views and opinions to be submitted in respect to the proposal. A summary of these issues are raised through the raised with consultees and the local authorities' responses are provided in the consultation report as detailed at Appendix A of this report. I'd be happy to provide further information in respect to the feedback we received at the end of the report if required. Cabinet will need to consider the consultation report presented uh, to you today and determine the preferred way forward. Should Cabinet wish to proceed with the proposal, the next stage of the process is to publish a statutory notice outlining the proposals which would need to be published for a period of 28 days and any formal written objections would be invited during this time. If there are no objections during the public notice period, then a proposal can be implemented with Cabinet's approval. If there are objections at this public notice stage, an objections report will be published summarising the objections and the local authorities' response to those objections. Cabinet will then need to consider, to consider the proposal in light of the uh, objections. Cabinet could then accept, reject or modify the proposals at that stage. The timetable is set out to paragraph 4.4 of this report. As determined at paragraph 8, the costs of the consultation will be met from existing budgets. If the proposal does go ahead and is implemented, then the cost of the new schools will be funded via an annual charge to the revenue budget over a 25 year period, which will need to be built into the medium term financial strategy as a budget pressure. Early estimates are specified in the report that this could be in the region of £500,000 per annum, and this will be de determined as the scheme progresses. Therefore, Lisa, I take you to the recommendations of the report of paragraph 9. Specifically, the Cabinet notes the contents of the report and authorises the publication of the consultation report and the public notice in respect to the Bridgend West schemes. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, uh, Lindsay, and a very warm welcome to, uh, to Gaynor as, uh, as the expert lead officer on, uh, on school modernisation. Um, so, very warm welcome. Uh, uh, again, uh, I can see that uh, uh, Councillor Smith wants to uh, come in. Councillor Smith, please. Thank you. Welcome, Gainer. Uh, you're always welcome and uh, you always bring positive news and I regard this as a, a very positive item this afternoon. Uh, I think it's a very exciting time for the community of North Canary because they are going to receive not one but two 21st century schools. In case there's any misconception out there, um, I'd like to say that this is a cooperative venture with um, the Housing Association, V2C. We've had meetings with them and with the, the, the local members, and they were very positive meetings. Uh, and uh, the, the scheme involves um, a land swap, which uh, I think is a very innovative way of going about this. And the way that we're going about it ensures that 
there's as much continuity as possible as well as change. So no child or teacher will have to move premises until the new premise is absolutely ready. And that is built into the um, the the sequencing uh, of the plan. Again, to try and preempt perhaps uh, misconceptions that might be out there in the Twitterverse and elsewhere. Um, this isn't um, uh, something which should uh, set alarm bells ring. The fact I just mentioned a land swap doesn't mean that anybody is making money out of land. This, this isn't a money making exercise. This is not a cost cutting austerity exercise. This is a modernization pr uh, program with with funding from Welsh Government and from BCBC and um, it's an investment in the future of Canelli. Canelli has seen changes in its um, school provision over the years for the simple fact that Canelli has been a rapidly growing uh, community. Uh, some of us are old enough to remember the, um, the Vic Victorian or Edwardian school at Canelli Cross which stayed in existence for a little while after the opening of the, the new um, facility in uh, 1958. The, 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 um, the building which lots of people in Canelli still think of as the new school, although it was built in 1958. And of course the Canelli cross site now is, is, has become uh, housing. So these things change over time. Um, so it, it's it's um, what it is 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 it, it's a modernization program. I've got a lot of empathy with Canelli. I, I was um, a tenant in on the Marlis estate shortly after, not ex not immediately after, but shortly after we were married. We were lucky enough to have a maisonette in Nonacariadon, literally next door to the Avonavelin site, and my daughter who is now 45, uh, unbelievably. After she was born, she uh, her first bedroom was in on the third floor in a maisonette uh, overlooking the railway line in um, on the Marlis uh, estate. Soon after the um, 1958 building was, was built, I remember walking um, to Canelli with other pupils from Pyle Juniors to play cricket against Canelli. Uh, our side was rubbish and we lost the um, the match. I don't think we ever I don't think we ever beat them at um, uh, at cricket. Probably not at anything else either. So uh, I've got a bit of emotional baggage as well in that building. Uh, I can see some doubts in the consultation, some doubts about um, Avonavellin being swamped in a bigger school. I think we need to work hard to pacify those doubts and to reassure people that being in a big school, bigger school, doesn't mean that uh, uh, one's child is going to be lost and we lose the small school ethos. There are limits on class sizes anyway, and we will work very hard to make sure that there is a, a village school ethos in the bigger school and um, to prove that that's possible I think um, when conditions allow it would be great if we could take parents and governors and teachers to see similar situations in Pencoid and also in Bryn Menin where essentially a traditional village school has been replaced close by by a spanking new 21st century school and nobody there would want to go back. They do miss they do miss the old buildings in a strange sort of way, but they, but given the choice, they wouldn't go back. And I'm sure that will be the same thing in um, Canelli. Um, so I think uh, um, we've had conversations with the local members. I know the local members um, uh, also our governors and uh, one of them is chair of governors of two of, two of the schools. I, I think I'm right in saying that. Um, we've spoken to staff and obviously there's going to be some some worries and fears, but we will do everything we possibly can to make everybody happy with uh, the new situation. And I think it will be um, a wonderful day for Canelli when they've got those two new schools up and running. 
Uh, so we've got no hesitation in um, uh, recommending that we go to the next stage in the legal process. Uh, Leader, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Councillor Smith. Councillor Burnett is next, please. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really happy to to second this report. I think it's hugely positive, and I mean, our intentions as a cabinet are definitely to make sure that our children throughout the county get the best educational experience, and that we are providing quality uh, learning um, facilities and and community friendly facilities as well. And and there's you know, th there's so much potential here um, going forward. I am interested, I know that school governors have been, have had an opportunity of being invited to contribute their, their thoughts and opinions at, at this stage in the process. So I just wanted to know from you, Lindsay, um, what this, what, what feedback we're getting from governors at the moment, because they're, they're a vital part and as they represent um, the school community and, 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 the, and the community as well. Thank you, Councillor Burnett. Um, leader, if I may, uh, we're very lucky in Bridgen. We've got excellent school governors, not just in this area of Bridgen, but across all our schools. So obviously we, we're very fortunate for people to give up their own time to support our schools. Um, as you've mentioned, Councillor Burnett, all stakeholders, all key stakeholders, were, as per the school organisation code, were sent a notification link um, with regard to the consultation documents, so everyone would have seen that. And then in addition, then we held a virtual meeting with governors, um, and you can see the outcome of that meeting in the report. Um, just to give you some feedback really on what we had from that meeting, the general feedback was positive. Um, clearly, uh, governors had a range of questions for us, um, specifically looking at um, uh, staffing, for example. And clearly that's something that we will work through now with the shadow governing bodies and the governing bodies if this proposal is taken ahead. But we enjoy an excellent relationship with the governing bodies of the schools and uh, we, we, we're entirely happy to be working with them as this pr uh, proposal progresses. OK, thank you for that, uh, uh, Lindsay. Uh, uh, as you say, uh, they're, they're um, statutory consultees as part of the engagement process, uh, and I was pleased to see uh, that uh, overall, of course, there were questions in the meetings, those initial meetings that you've had, but I was pleased to see from the consultation report uh, that there was uh, uh, broad support um, from governors, uh, understandably there there were questions, there will always be questions uh, when such major uh, proposals are being uh, considered uh, and of course some of that detail uh, will, will not be available at this, at this early stage uh, because part of the uh, uh, purpose of the consultation actually is, is to is to shape the, the, the final uh, uh, set of uh, proposals uh, that um, that will be progressed uh, and uh, uh, we will uh, want to continue to work uh, and we will work very closely with all three uh, governing uh, bodies on on any proposals. Councillor Patel, uh, you are next, please. Thank you, Leader. Um, and thanks, Lindsay, for the report. Um, I've got quite, uh, I've got a few questions. Um, so um, yeah, I do welcome the report, and I do agree with my cabinet colleagues to um, go to the next stage and um, to consult with the public. Um, I a few questions. So um, I'd like to know what learning came from the CCYD merger because that was um, a a couple of schools that we merged together um, and you know it, it is doing well now um, and so I'm hoping that there's some sort of learning that we've we're going to bring from that to this um, if it does go ahead and then um, in terms of the consultation I'd like to um, specifically ask that um, children with additional learning needs um, are um, catered for because um, I've read with great interest the the feedback from from the pupils and I was really glad to see that we've you know we've been looking at the learner voice um, and part of this journey um, and um, yes I'd just like to um, I guess be reassured or know that um, those children that um, 
unable to engage um you know through the mainstream are also having the opportunity to put their views forward especially with you know great changes in in their education environment um and then the community facilities um i noticed um in some of the feedback as well there um there was some concern over um the loss of community facilities. I don't know if that's during construction period or overall. Um, and so I guess um, a bit about that and how we're going to deal with, um, you know, the construction and kind of, I think that what I read was that there were a number of people that were concerned about the rooms that they were using as community rooms um, and you mentioned Wi-Fi as well in a number of the reports. So I think that was um, something that I'd like to, to pick up on. And then also finally, um, in um, the, the timetable that you produced at point nine of the report, um, between the 9th of June 2021 and implementation um, in 2023, there isn't anything. And so I just wondered what, what would happen between those two dates. Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Patel. I hopefully I've caught all those. So again, <laughs> if I miss any, just, just let me know. Um, there are four questions there. One relates to community use. The other one relates to the timetable. You've also asked a really important question about learner voice and specifically learners with additional needs and also lessons learned from, from previous ones. So what I'll do, I'll cover the ones that I can and then I'll bring in, in Gainer then to offer any additional comments. So first of all, with regard to learning lessons from previous bills, one of the things we did with the band A schools is we convened a group of all head teachers that met on a monthly basis. I attended those meetings as well. And they've drawn up um, a number of key elements from those meetings that they then passed on to the school mod team and also to head teachers and were part of the proposals and certainly at an early date we've asked the, the the heads involved in the new schemes to be in touch with those and they will guide them through it and share their experiences with them now obviously it doesn't just relate to uh, head teachers in band a we'll also be looking for a school councils to be working with each other just to make sure they get a, a good feel on what's going on um, as far as the, um, the, the the learners with additional learning needs are concerned, I think the key thing is, first of all, we have in consulting learners, and you can see that in the report, but specifically, one of the things that we need to do is we need to engage all learners. So at the, the very beginning of the process, we sent out a link um, to all parents and carers um, with regard to the consultations. They were fully aware of what was going on. Um, we've also obviously met with the school council and they are representative bodies within their own schools. And then if proposals are taken forward, what we would do then, as with all new bills, um, when we reach the design stage, we would seek to work with pupils to ensure their feedback is built into the design process. Now, I've got personal experience with this. I was the deputy head teacher of the, the Mysa Highland School when it was first opened, and there was a considerable involvement of staff and learners at the beginning and during the initial um, premises occupation. So that was really positive. Um, in addition, all, obviously all new schools will need to be fully compliant with GDA requirements and building control measures. And just to make sure that the teaching and learning facilities within those schools best meets the needs of all learners, we would work very closely with our inclusion service colleagues to make sure that all um, uh, the needs of all people are met. Um, Gainer will, will be able to cover some other points on this, but as you'd be aware with all new school bills, uh, they need to be fully accessible. Um, there will be suitable rooms made available for people with additional learning needs. Lifts will be installed where required and also accessible toilet for, uh, facilities. So again, from that point of view, we have a range of statutory requirements that we would um, absolutely need to, um, to, to meet. Now, as far as the community use, um, the, the key element with all new bills is to make sure that uh, we allow for community access. And there's three key areas we're looking at at the moment of this one. First of all, is to ensure there are appropriate indoor and outdoor facilities. I think you've, you've just touched upon the point about community use of rooms. We'll be looking to install community Wi-Fi access within the building and also then looking at purpose built community rooms. Again, these would be the use of the rooms would be determined by the, um, the governing body. Now, one of the things we do need to do, we need to comply with school premises regulations 99, where we need to provide suitable outdoor provision just to make sure that we are uh, meeting the needs of, of this council and also that any new outdoor areas will be designed for community use. 
So hopefully that gives you um, um, an idea of some of the areas we've we've, we've certainly uh, prioritised um, at this very early stage. But perhaps uh, through you, lead, I can bring in Gainer that might be able to give some specifically some lessons learned from the the CCYD build. Of course, yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Th uh, thank you, uh, Gainer. Thank you, Leader. For the purposes of the recording, my name is Gaina Thomas. I'm Schools Programme Manager. So in relation to um, the CCYD build and lessons learned from that, it was very important to actually bring both staffs together from an early stage and um, try to make sure that the ethos of the existing schools transitioned across to the new school. That was a massive lesson learned from, from um, and it's our German former Ogmo Comprehensive Schools. And I'd like to think that um, Avonavelli and Canelli staff have already recognised that and um, during our consultation meeting they actually said that they wanted to work together and make sure that the new school st was um, started off on the best foot in, so that was very encouraging. Okay. Um, is there okay. any questions? I think that was it, but you're, you're, you're right to uh, it's it's um, it, the, we've learned those lessons, haven't we, from from previous um, from previous amalgamations of of schools, um, uh, not just CCYD, but but other um, uh, proposals over the years. Because um, uh, back in I think it was about 2004, Gainer, we probably had over 70 schools in there. In the borough, and now we have less than less than sixty. Yeah. So we we have gone through a program of rationalisation of not just secondary schools, uh, but 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 primary schools, junior schools, infant schools. So we have a whole range of different experiences. Uh, and what is important, and I I can see that th that is the uh, the crucial ingredient here is there's a there's very much a commitment, isn't there, um, from the schools to 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 work together, um, and 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 to make a success of, of whatever proposals are 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 progressed, uh, and and I think in any um, in any um, uh, new school, uh, that's uh, a, a fundamental building block in, in terms of uh, uh, creating uh, that um, that that. A successful uh, and um, sustainable and positive uh, um, environment for, for children. Uh, Councillor Yang, I can see that you wanted to come in. Please. Thanks, Leader. Just dropping my hand in case I forget. Uh, I'm of the same age, you see, as Councillor Smith, and we forget these things. Um, just a comment really with regard to this report and I'm looking at uh, Appendix 3 uh, and uh, in particular the um, the team's meeting and the consultation with us call of uh, and uh, that was a meeting for with the school council uh, in order to tease out if you like what the pupils themselves thought about the change now I'm I'm a great believer in Welsh medium education and I think that uh, uh, the depth and the uh, of the questions asked by the pupils on this occasion is, 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 is quite interesting to be honest with you. It was obvious to me that these people understood exactly what was going on and the questions that they were asking were quite targeted uh, and I think they were uh, quite probing, to be perfectly honest with you, and I'm pleased to see that it shows that Welsh education in Bridgend, as I suspected, is of a very, very high quality, and I want to see that continue. Uh, but what was uh, pleasing uh, to me in particular was the fact that when asked, um, uh, would the, when the reps from the uh, school council were asked, uh, is this proposal a good idea? all of them agreed that it was a good idea. So I'm very, very pleased that those that will be using the school are happy with the proposal. And on that basis, I'm happy to uh, support uh, this, uh, this, 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 the, the recommendations from officers. So thank you all involved in this. There's obviously a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes. And in that meeting, the one that I was talking about, was conducting on the 11th of February, so a lot of work is going on. 
So thank the team from us for that. Uh, and I'm happy to support the recommendation leader. Thank you for uh, that, uh, Councillor Yang. And um, Councillor Yang uh, uh, raises uh, uh, a point that um, is uh, at the heart of of um, the the decision making here about uh, the future of Welsh medium uh, education in the borough and how we uh, extend and improve um, the um, the the offer and increase the number of uh, of pupils um, accessing uh, Welsh medium education whilst at the same time improving the um, improving the uh, the, um, the 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 facilities and buildings for uh, children in in English medium education uh, as well, both uh, 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 at, at at the centre of what we're planning here. Do you want to uh, outline the um, the current um, plans in terms of Welsh medium education for the uh, the west of the uh, borough, please? Thanks, Leader. Um, yes, and just just to reiterate what you and Councillor Young have both said, this is a massive priority for us as, as an education uh, directorate. Welsh medium education obviously features as part of our ESTIN post inspection action plan. And also we, we are very passionate about meeting our requirements within our WESP targets. So obviously this is a, a very high priority. Um, I think there are two elements that we are looking at in the West. Uh, the first one is obviously um, mentioned within this report. It's looking at improving a significant improvement to the Escola Vejo Scare site um, and providing state-of-the-art facilities for um, learners wishing an education through the medium of Welsh in that area. And also we're currently involved with a number of uh, really interesting pieces of work with Welsh Government, uh, specifically around increasing Welsh media provision in Puthcall. So again, these are two um, separate but very important parts of our um, school modernisation programme and also a very clear part um, just to substantiate our intention to increase the number of Welsh um, speakers within the county borough. And can I say how personally uh, excited and very excited about the proposals for both provision in uh, Canelli and in Pathcall uh, uh, as well, and I know how um, enthusiastic uh, uh, me members of the community are in in Perth Call, uh, and uh, and excited as well. Excited as we are, more excited, possibly uh, than we are about the prospect of developing um, Welsh uh, medium uh, education in in the, in the town. So uh, that is um, it is is wonderful actually to to be to be talking and thinking about that there's a long way to go uh, but we're on those uh, first steps uh, in that uh, journey uh, councillor smith i can see that you want to uh, come in Possibly. sorry about that a bit of delay getting the uh... Yeah, just to um, repeat a couple of things, although um, when I uh, did my teacher training, our educational psychologist uh, in those days used to say, don't repeat, reinforce. So this is reinforcement, uh, <laughs> not not uh, repetition. I want to reinforce two points, really. When, and I think they are sort of assumptions and misconceptions which reveal themselves in the appendices when we're looking at some of the feedback. And I think we, we've all got a bit of work to do to, um, to uh, talk to people and to convince them uh, that um, everything is OK and they needn't worry about these two things. One was from Avena Velin, where there, there was an assumption that, that a larger school would mean more anonymity uh, and um, uh, bigger classes and I think we can tackle that by showing um, parents and young people and teachers what happens in uh, one of our one of our modernized schools and uh, uh, the way that um, uh, things are laid out there and the way that classes are managed I think will preserve that small school ethos which obviously have an avail in uh, folk uh, treasure. 
And the other was a misconception in the feedback on Verkhor Scare. Uh, there was an assumption that uh, expanding at Canelli would uh, mean that um, there wouldn't be any provision at Porth Call, and, and that is a total misconception. This is complementary to Porth Call. We, we have ambitions for uh, a primary Welsh medium education uh, uh, at Porth Call, and those plans will take shape in the near future. Yeah, thank, thanks for that, uh, uh, Councillor Smith, and, uh, and I know that'll be uh, music to the ears of of, of members in Perth Call. I can see that uh, the Mayor, Councillor Watts, is, is here today, uh, but but uh, I know that he was also uh, uh, pleased. I remember receiving an email off him, uh, might be some years ago now, about the condition of uh, Vachoske, um, but that, that uh, that building is not fit for purpose, is it? So that's one of the reasons why uh, this uh, uh, proposal has been brought forward. And also, um, uh, I'm sure Lindsay and Gaynor can confirm that uh, neither are um, uh, Alvin Avellin and Canelli uh, primary schools fit for the purpose, fit for purpose either. Both have significant backlogs of repairs and maintenance. And even if we carried out those works, then those schools would not be of the standard that we now expect in the in the 21st uh, century. Uh, so I, that is something that needs to be um, reinforced, but not repeated, uh, uh, because it is a, a point that has been made in the consultation uh, and it's a, it's an understandable um, reaction, perhaps from some, that they are um, uh, uh, happy with the the quality of education, and the quality of education is very good in all the schools. However, uh, the uh, facilities are not, and we need better facilities for all our children. And also, even if the school appears to be in good condition in parts to some. Uh, parents and pupils, we have technical officers who've carried out full condition surveys of all buildings. That's correct, isn't it, uh, uh, Lindsay and Gaynor? Mm -hmm. And they are not in good condition. And we have seen in other parts of the borough, namely Kemphig Hill, where it, if we don't take action, then sometimes um, the conditions of buildings, even with investment, decline because these buildings were not uh, designed uh, and built to last for as long as they have, uh, then um, we are sometimes forced into making uh, uh, short term, very disruptive decisions around the future of, of some of our buildings. Uh, and that's certainly a, 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 a big factor for me. I don't want us to be in a position where we are reacting in the future uh, to um, a backlog of repairs and maintenance um, uh, when actually we, we we cannot be confident that even if uh, the money was made available and it is not available, it's not available from Welsh Government for that type of activity, it would not necessarily secure those buildings for the long term. And we have to think of the long term here, don't we, in terms of uh, in terms of the facilities that are, that are available. Uh, and. Uh, I, I just wanted to check that that was the case in terms of the the conditions of the of the buildings because it, it that that was repeated in some of the um, in some of the the consultation responses that uh, people would were of the view that the the buildings were of of a better uh, condition than they actually were because of their physical appearance without necessarily understanding some of the um, infrastructure that um, is 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 uh, vital in any builder, but not necessarily apparent to uh, general users and, and visitors to those buildings. Yeah, thanks, Steve. I, I can confirm that both buildings, well, the three buildings actually require work. Um, the one thing I just want to touch upon is I think it is testimony to um, the head teachers, the governors and the staff of the school, not just teaching and learning staff, but also those who undertake really important roles within our kitchens and our cleaners. That they've done a remarkable job in those three buildings, keeping them you know, looking really good. 
I was in Connelly just before Christmas, and you know it was it, 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 they've done a really really good job there. Um, but we're just really excited about making sure we get them the best possible teacher learning environments going forward. Yeah, you're right. They've done an incredible job actually with buildings that are not as they should be. Um, but we, we can't forget that you know behind that is a, a buildings that are uh, uh, really showing their age. Um, right. OK, well, we've had uh, um, the recommendations uh, uh, moved and seconded. Um, are everyone, uh, is everyone in agreement with those uh, recommendations, uh, please, colleagues? Agreed. OK. Aye. Aye. Thank you, um, everyone, and, and thank you very much to, um, to Lindsay Gaynor. And Chris is our our project uh, officer on this one. Is it is it Chris? So no no doubt uh, uh, Chris is um, is 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 going to become an expert on on Canelli, uh, uh, and all on all matters relating to Canelli. And I'm sure we'll work very very and is working. I know he's working, and I'm sure we will in the future work very closely with uh, uh, the community. Um, uh, we look forward to this 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 next phase of this project. Uh, we want to, to, to hear people's views uh, and we want this to be a success and we want to, to hear from people about how we think we can, um, how, ca how we can make it as uh, a flagship for us. Um, so, you know, the final plans are not there yet. Uh, that is something we will, we will work on and we will work on it together with uh, the the head teachers, the teachers, all the staff, the schools, uh, governors, uh, parents, uh, and um, most importantly of all, we will work with the, the children and young people who I know are very, very excited uh, about this um, and, and always, always provide us, don't they, Gaynor, you know, with some of the, the, the best suggestions about um, how we can build new schools, though we never did get them the giraffes they wanted in Coiti Primary School. We did, but they were they were small wooden ones, but they do always come up with the, the best ideas. So uh, we look forward to the, their engagement uh, with that and with the local members and the community council too. So we'll, we'll look to set something up with uh, with, with, with them as 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 uh, as important local partners as well. OK, thank you very much Gaina. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon uh, and no doubt we will receive a future report as this uh, progresses. Uh, that is the, the final report on today's uh, agenda. I have had uh, no urgent items that um, uh, by reason of special circumstances uh, have been uh, brought to me for consideration uh, at today's uh, uh, meeting. And uh, therefore, um, I uh, declare uh, the meeting closed. And thank you very much, all of you, for your attendance. And I look forward uh, to seeing some of you again uh, very uh, uh, soon. So uh, not forgetting there is a, ca a cabinet, uh, another cabinet meeting this week on corporate parenting. Uh, very important uh, meeting, and I hope um, that um, all uh, members of the, uh, the the committee, including invitees from non-cabinet members, uh, are able to attend uh, that uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, leader. Thank